Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Mike Dimmick. I'm the president of the Pew Research Center, and I'll be kicking off our deep dive, dive today on Trump, Brexit, and a new world order. Um, by background, I'm a survey researcher, and the data I'll be presenting to you at the start of our session today is based on some global survey work we've just completed. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Pew Research Center, uh, we are what we call a fact tank. Uh, we try to generate a foundation of facts that can enrich the public conversation and inform sound decision making. We're centered in Washington, D.C., but we do work all around the world, as you'll see here today. Uh, the focus today is on some public opinion and reactions to recent big changes around the world in America and the Brexit vote. But we also apply a variety of research methods, demographic, migration studies, media, technology, uh, content analysis. We're always trying to understand what's on people's minds, how they're behaving, how they're navigating the new information environment. Most importantly, we're nonpartisan, and we typically want to bring information to the table to help inform the conversations about policy and change and its implications, which is why this is a great setup today, because we've got some fantastic experts who can cue off of the data that I'll present uh, and really talk about the implications. Um, so my role is part MC and part presenter, uh, um, and we'll be breaking this session up into three sections. I'll kick it off with some findings from a survey that we just completed a few weeks ago of 40,000 people around the globe in 37 countries that I'll be presenting to you today. Uh, these are big undertakings for us, but for a little over 15 years now, we've tried to track global views and attitudes about both the US, but also issues around globalization, change, uh, public policy issues, cultural issues, uh, technological issues, and so forth. Um, the report I'll start off with, and that cues up the first of the two panels that we'll have here today, focuses on global views of American leadership, uh, Donald Trump, uh, and overall views of the United States and its role in world affairs. This is based on a report we just issued yesterday, and you're one of the first audiences that we're presenting this data to. Um, in the middle, I'll switch gears and really dive into the European conversation. As part of this survey of 37 nations, we did interviews with 10, in 10 nations that are part of the EU, and tracking attitudes towards the EU, reactions to the Brexit vote last year, and outlook for the EU among these member nations. And that will be the subject matter of the second of the two panels that will follow me in this deep dive. So without further ado, let me go ahead and dive into the data. Uh, at the Pew Research Center, we're sort of data geeks, and when we get 40,000 interviews, we really want to share a lot of it with you. So let me jump right in and throw a bunch of numbers at you uh, to try to frame up these conversations. Um, let's start with the big picture. Um, how is the globe, how are people around the, around the world looking at Donald Trump as uh, the leadership of the United States? This is a question we've been asking for over 15 years. Basically, how much confidence do you have in various global leaders to make the right decisions when it comes to world affairs? A great deal, some, not much or none at all. Uh, here we're showing the share who offer a great deal or some confidence. On the left side of this, you're seeing how people viewed Barack Obama at the end of his presidency, a global median of 64% saying they were confident, at least somewhat, in his decision-making on global affairs. The new survey finding just 22% saying the same about Donald Trump uh, and his decision making. Um, that's a big turnaround. I'll put that in some historical context in a moment. But I also want to point out how it's affected views of the United States, a more modest but still significant change in views of the US. This is a standard view overall. Do you have a favorable or unfavorable view of the United States? At the end of the Obama presidency, uh, by a 64 to 26% margin, typically we were seeing favorable views of the US around the world. Today, a much still favorable but much tighter margin and an overall 15-point decline in the share offering a favorable impression. Now, just to give you a sense of the scope of this, these are the countries that we interviewed around the world this cycle, 37 nations. Uh, there is data from the US that we'll be reporting a little bit later on a lot of these same issues. The orange, dark colors are where views of the United States have declined around the world over the last year or two. Uh, green, you see one blotch there where views of the US have actually improved over the last year or two. 
Um, you see the steepest decline around the world in Mexico, and I'll show you a little bit more detail on that, but the Mexican reaction to this election cycle has been very stark. But you also saw declines in American favorability of 20 points or more in many European countries, Spain, Netherlands, Sweden, and Germany. Uh, across some African countries, 20 point or more declines in Ghana, Senegal, and Tanzania. Uh, and in Latin America, both Brazil and Chile, very steep declines in overall views of the United States. Russia, I think, goes without saying the one outlier on that map, for those of you who can read maps, and I'll talk more about that as well. Let's look a little bit more closely at Europe. This is tracking over the past 16 years overall views and uh, confidence in the U.S. president across four key U.S. allies in, the, in uh, Europe, the U.K., France, Germany, and Spain. It starts in 2001 at the start of George W. Bush's presidency, um, and it goes through the Obama presidency with the newest data in 2017 here. A bit of a roller coaster picture, as you can see, uh, and you can see the current figures in those four countries in terms of confidence in Trump uh, across those European allies. I think the thing to really note here, and it's kind of obvious, is how parallel those views are to how these publics viewed George W. Bush at the end of his presidency. For example, you see 22% in the UK offering confidence in, in uh, Trump's leadership around the world. That was 16% at the end of Bush's administration. In Germany, 11% today. That was 14% uh, at the end of Bush's administration. So there's a real parallel in attitudes, overall attitudes, about the confidence people have in the American president, though as you'll see in a few slides later, for very different reasons. The, the posture of those two presidents almost couldn't be more different in how they're seen. Uh, just to give that an overview, the green line here is now taking all of those European countries and sort of merging them together into a median just to show that change in a general sense, and then overlaying it with favorability of the U.S. Just to make that point that while there can be radical shifts in how people view the U.S. president, views of the U.S. overall move more modestly, but do move significantly. So that 15-point decline from 61 to 46 percent favorable towards the U.S. across European publics is what we're looking at right now. Just to give you some more context about what that means, when we interviewed in these same 10 European countries uh, a year ago, in 2016, in nine of those 10 countries, majorities offered a favorable view of the United States, nine out of 10. Today, it's only four out of 10 where majorities offer a favorable view of the United States. So there has been a real impact on views of America in Europe. Let's take a look at Mexico, where we've seen the steepest drops from, a, from a, you can see that 5% confidence in Donald Trump's uh, decision making and global affairs. That is the single lowest rating Trump received in the 37 countries that we interviewed around the world. But that's dropped from 66% favorability of the US to 30% was also the steepest decline in overall views of the United States around the world. And I'll talk a little more about that later in terms of how it's affected Mexican public's views of the American people as well. Uh, turning north, uh, views in Canada mirror what we saw in, in, in Europe in many ways. Uh, you see that steep flip in terms of views of Trump, I'm sorry, views of George W. Bush, much higher views of Obama through his presidency, and now a steep decline back to a figure very similar to where uh, Canadian opinion of George W. Bush at the end of his presidency. But take note there, 43% in Canada have a favorable opinion of the U.S. today. We've never seen that go below 50% in the 15 years that we've been doing this research. Uh, another key U.S. ally, Israel, has held much more steady in this regard. In fact, Israel is one of two countries, including Russia, where Trump ex uh, receives more confidence from the public than Obama did at the end of his presidency, 56% saying they have confidence in Trump's global leadership, uh, slightly higher than the 49% at the end of Obama's presidency, and a continued 81% favorability of the United States and Israel. And then I'll wrap up this little series by looking at Russia, perhaps even more of a roller coaster ride in Russian views of the United States and U.S. leadership. But you see how low Russian views of the U.S. had gotten by 2015, the last year in Obama's presidency we did surveys in Russia, um, and how they've shot up as, Obama, as Donald Trump came into office, 53% uh, offering confidence in his leadership, and a 26% rise in favorability of the U.S. Now, these surveys were all finished about three to four weeks ago before some of the more recent events in Syria. Uh, it may be that there's some fluctuation still going on related to events here, but clearly a more positive picture in Russia. Now, let's talk a little bit about global views of Trump. This may be too small for some of you to read, but I'll share it with you. 
views of Trump are related both to policy and personality. And let's start with Trump and policy. We tested five different policy proposals that Trump had focused on during his presidency and the early stages of his, uh, during the campaign and the early stages of his presidency. And we found globally negative reactions to all five of the proposals that we uh, tested. On the left, you see withdrawal of US support from the Iran nuclear weapons agreement. Uh, more disapproval than approval as a global median. In 22 out of 37 countries, more disapproval than approval. Um, the second one, introducing tighter restrictions on those entering the U.S. from majority Muslim countries. The Muslim ban conversation viewed very negatively around the world in 28 of the 37 countries, uh, predominantly negative views. Um, Let's focus in on the climate agreement issue. This survey was conducted predominantly prior to Trump's announcement that he was going to re re remove the U.S. from the Paris Accords, uh, but you know his policy position had been pretty clear by that point. Globally, an extremely negative policy decisions. Majorities in 32 of the 37 countries disapprove of that de decision by the U.S. It rises to as high as 93% disapproval in places like Germany and Sweden. Even in Russia, by two to one more disapproval than approval of that policy proposal uh, that Trump had put forward. And we can talk a little about U.S. trade agreements, also deeply negative. Majorities in 32 of the 37 countries disapprove of Trump's proposal to remove the U.S. or withdraw the U.S. from global trade agreements. Um, this is viewed, majority disapprove of this in every Latin American country we interviewed, every European, European sort of country that we interviewed. Trump's character. Uh, we asked a number of traits that people might associate with Trump. Uh, and, uh, you know, more than anything else, the world sees arrogance as Trump's most defining characteristic. A median around the world of 75% saying they think of Donald Trump as arrogant. That rises over 90% in all of the Western European countries we interviewed, Canada, Mexico, and Australia as well. Um, also, you see intolerant and dangerous as common reactions to Trump. We tested more positive phrases, qualified, cares about ordinary people, not so common. But notice in the middle there, a strong leader. Uh, many people around the world see, would define Trump as a strong leader. What they take from that, whether they agree or disagree with him in terms of the direction of his leadership. Now, just to be fair, we also looked at other global leaders with the same measure of confidence. And Trump is not the only global leader these days who lacks confidence from publics around the world. You can see the Chinese leader and the Russian leader we also tested getting majorities on average around the world offering no confidence in their decision making about global affairs. By contrast, Angela Merkel stands apart uh, uh, with a global median of 42% confident in her decision making and 31% not confident. That holds within the EU as well as I'll show you in a second. Um, so what are the implications of this? I think that's part of the point of this deep dive is to talk about what this might mean for global affairs. But we asked people around the world how do they thought their country's relationship with the U.S. might change as a result of Trump's presidency? And what you find, I think, is interesting because despite these really negative evaluations of Trump overall, you're finding pluralities in many parts of the world saying that it's not going to affect their country's relationship with the U.S. that much. Notice in Latin America and in Europe, these are medians within each of those regions, just to summarize the data a little bit here. You're finding roughly half or so saying they don't expect their country's relationship with the U.S. to change significantly because of this. You see that in many other parts of the world. Now, to be sure, among those who think Trump means a change for their country's relationship. You're seeing more get worse than get better by about two to one in many countries. There are two countries in the world where majorities think their relationship with the U.S. is going to get worse. That's Mexico and Germany of the 37 countries we interviewed. You had three countries where they feel like their relationship will get better, Israel, Russia, and Nigeria. And then, you know, one of the broader implications of all of this is what it means for America's leadership around the world, what we often refer to as soft power. Do we set an example in the world? Do people listen? Do they follow? Is America seen as a model in world affairs? And we've tested a number of these views of the U.S. over the years. Uh, and to some extent, there is a reservoir of goodwill towards America. And you see it in particular about views of the American people. So we asked, I showed you before, about favorable opinions of the United States. Now we're asking about how you feel about the American people. 
And we find that around the globe, by roughly two to one, there's more favorable than unfavorable sentiment toward the American people. And that's remained fairly constant uh, in many parts of the world. In Europe, we've seen no real decline in views of the American people, but we have seen declines in other parts of the world. In Africa, American people are still viewed favorably, but it has dropped significantly over the last three to four years. In Latin America, we've seen very steep declines. Mexico, as I mentioned before, being one of the steepest, an 18-point drop in how Mexicans view the American people uh, from, from uh, uh, two years ago. 16-point declines in Brazil and Chile as well. And I'll flip over to one other one just, just for the sake of expediency here. Uh, how people view American ideas and customs coming into their country. We see a wide range of opinions around this and some souring of these views in some parts of the world. Uh, the, the idea that American ideas and customs are a positive is widespread in a lot of East Asia. Japan, the Philippines, South Korea, Vietnam, a lot of embrace of American culture and ideas and customs spreading. Uh, much more negative views across much of the Muslim world from Indonesia to Turkey. You see very negative evaluations on this rating. So really negative and haven't really changed much. We have again seen deep, steep declines in sub-Saharan Africa on this measure over the last five years or so from being very positive views of US culture and customs to being much more mixed uh, now. So that was the first part of this presentation. Let me dive deeper into the EU briefly to set up the second part of the conversation. And uh, here again, I'm talking about 10 countries that are members of the EU that we've done survey work in for a number of years. And let me start with a picture from a year ago, okay? We did our survey work just before the Brexit vote, and what we were seeing was a pretty steep decline in views of the EU across many EU member nations. So here we're looking at a favorability rating of the EU, and you saw this steep decline of, of double-digit declines in favorability in Germany, Spain, the UK, this is on the eve of the vote, uh, and in France there. Um, so what's happened over the last year since the Brexit vote, you've seen a real spike in favorable attitudes towards uh, the EU in mu across much of the region. Even in the UK, that blue line down there, now back to majority favorable views in the UK, uh, and uh, steep, steep increases in many other parts of the, of the EU. Uh, you'll notice we've done other survey work, Hungary, Sweden, Netherlands, steep increases, more flat in Italy, and Greece really remains an outlier among the 10 countries where views of the EU remain very negative and haven't improved at all. Now, just because favorability is up doesn't mean that people don't still have concerns about the EU and its leadership uh, within the member nations. This is a question about whether you uh, approve or disapprove of the way the European Union is dealing with economic issues facing the region. And you couldn't see probably more divergence of attitudes on that front. Notice near the top where disapproval outweighs approval is almost all in southern uh, Europe, Greece, Italy, France, Spain, uh, whereas the northern European countries and east European countries like Hungary and Poland a bit more positive in terms of EU's handling of economic issues. But on another issue that's been front and center in Europe, how the EU's been handling the refugee crisis, a year ago these views were very negative and they've remained negative today. Uh, a widespread disapproval of how the EU's dealing with refugee issues. Notice how acute that is in places like Greece and Italy where there's been a big, where the refugee issue has been very front and center. Uh, but majority disapproval across the region. Will Brexit be good or bad for the EU? Well. There's a fair amount of unanimity across, the nine, across all of the EU countries that this is going to be bad for the EU. Britain pulling out is going to have more negative than positive for other EU member nations. Notice how low that is in Sweden, 86%, Netherlands, 80%, saying that Brexit is going to be bad for the region. Will it be good or bad for the UK to leave the EU? More mixed views on that front. Notice the second line down is views of, of, of residents of the UK themselves remain divided on this front, almost an even split between thinking it'll be good or bad for Britain to be out of the EU. Much more negative views in Germany, Spain, Netherlands, Sweden on the bottom of that chart. Um, now, interestingly, Many Europeans would support having a referendum in their country. In fact, in seven of the nine countries outside the UK, we asked people, would you support having a referendum in your nation about withdrawing from the EU? We found half or more in seven countries saying they would support that. So for some EU supporters, that may be a little nerve-wracking. 
But this next slide shows that there's also overwhelming support for staying in the EU. So while people may support a vote on it, you're finding majority support for their countries staying in the EU across all of the nine countries outside the UK that we interviewed. Even in Greece, where you saw those very negative views about the EU persisting, 58 to 36 saying that they would support staying in the EU if a vote were to come in their country. And let me just wrap up quickly by talking about Germany, because one of the big sort of geopolitical implications of Brexit's departure is whether Germany becomes more of a hegemon within the EU and whether that raises new concerns. And this is just to point out that across Europe, there really are ambivalent views on this front. Germany is viewed very favorably, 71% on media and favorable towards Germany across the EU nations. Uh, as I pointed out before, a fair amount of confidence in Angela Merkel's decision making in Europe. Uh, but we asked a question, uh, do you think Germany has too much, too little, or about the right amount of influence when it comes to decision making in the EU? And you can see pluralities, almost half on average, saying too much influence uh, in EU decision making. And just to finish by breaking that out, you see very, very steep regional differences of opinion over Germany's role in the EU. Notice Greece, 89% too much. Uh, Germany, down at the bottom, only 10% too much, right? 60% say it's about right. 26% think they could have more influence. Uh, so a wide range of views, but again, sort of southern and eastern Europe much more nervous about Germany's influence uh, than you're seeing in uh, northern Europe and Germany itself. So let me wrap up there and bring us to a conversation around these data and other issues related to this. Let me invite Wendy and Richard and Jim Fallows up to start here. And while they're coming up, let me introduce them briefly, although I think all three really need no introduction. Um, Wendy Sherman is a senior counselor at Albright Stonebridge Group, has a rich foreign policy career uh, in the Obama administration, of course, serving as Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs and led the negotiating team uh, on the Iran nuclear deal during that period. Um, uh, full disclosure, Wendy's husband, Bruce Stokes, works at the Pew Research Center and is right now in Europe presenting on this same data uh, for us. Uh, Richard Haas, uh, president of the Council for Foreign Relations, served as a senior Middle East advisor to President George H.W. Bush and advisor to Colin Powell, has written many, many books on foreign affairs, most recently, A World in Disarray, American Foreign Policy in the Crisis of the Old Order, appropriate to all of this. And of course, Jim Fallows, who to an Aspen crowd needs no introduction, a national correspondent for The Atlantic, authored 10 books, win, won many awards for his work, and covers a wide range of US and global affairs. So Jim, let me turn it over to you to lead the discussion. Great, thank you very much. Let me explain the procedure for the rest of the thing. We're going to have two half hour panels, each discussing some of the US centric and European centric aspects of this fascinating survey. And when that's over, we'll bring all of our panelists plus Michael up to have a uh, question session at the end. So that, that's, that's our plan for the next while. We, I'll just be interviewing uh, Richard and Wendy now, and then we'll have uh, Yasha and Alexander after them, and then we'll all rejoin here. Um, let me start asking you, Richard, is there anything that surprised you or caught your eye about that fascinating presentation we just saw? Two things. Uh, first of all, congratulations on the, the, the survey. The, the, the breadth and depth is quite extraordinary. Uh, Two things. One is, after all those negative takes on the United States, how our reputation has taken a major hit, you then have the question, but will this affect your relationship with the United States? And most respondents say no. So to me, to me after all the negatives, how sanguine or cons people were. And the question I have is whether I believe that or not. And whether if people continue to feel negative over an extended period of time, it is passing strange that it would have no consequences. And you've got to think that somewhere over time it would add to a degree of uh, distancing, a certain lack of deference to American preferences. So this suggests that all, all the information doesn't have much, it's kind of the so what question. <laughs> My own view is I find that hard to believe. So I'd be curious if the alienation, or whatever word you want to call it, continues, deepens or continues, does it continue to have as little impact as this poll would suggest? I bet not. The other thing that was fascinating, and see, you know, life's tough enough, I believe, and the British get the award for making life unnecessarily tougher. <laughs> and this poll is like, this is you know, pouring salt in the wound. 
because what you see on the Brexit poll is essentially a, a plurality. I can't remember if it was a majority or plurality of Brits are feeling pretty good about the EU. And it suggests, though it doesn't exactly say if the vote were to be repeated, that now Brexit would lose. So here we are. It's just about, what, a year and a couple of days after the vote. Uh, Theresa May has just formed a new government. They're going to persist with going ahead with, I think, one of the worst self-inflicted wounds in modern history. And this poll suggests just not that it's wrong-headed. That's a different issue. But now, in a funny sort of way, the politics don't continue to demand it. So if I were a British politician and I saw this poll and I were in the Remain camp, I would be thinking awfully hard about how do I resurrect the political issue of Brexit, because Brexit was an advisory vote. Parliament retains sovereignty. So the question is, how do you get this revisited? Because this is a fiasco that still, it's not too late, it could still be avoided, and this shows the politics might actually work in favor of those who are, uh, are anti-Brexit. It's a good thing there are no other <laughs> illustrations in the world of unwise policies being pushed through exactly. uh, public <laughs> support. But that's for, those are for other panels. Uh, Wendy, what caught your eye about this survey? Well, a couple of things. Um, I know the historical data pretty well for Pew because, as Mike pointed out, my husband, Bruce Stokes, uh, works there and, and helps to do this poll. Um, when George Bush was first elected, Which one? George Bush 43, um, as the Iraq war proceeded, his numbers started to fall. But even as his numbers started to fall, like this poll, um, people liked America and they liked Americans. When we reelected George Bush, that changed. Uh, and what we see here is not a dissimilar trend, a deeper one actually than for George Bush 43. But basically, right now I think the world, and for those of us who travel and a lot of us do, this poll feels exactly right. <laughs> Everywhere we go people say, what the? are you all doing, right? <laughs> so uh, my concern, however, is that right now, there's still faith in America, there's still faith in Americans, but how long that will last, and I think that's the conundrum with the I expect our bilateral relationship to continue. It's a faith in our system, but there were two numbers in there that are very concerning. One, that there's really great question about our democracy and the concept of our democracy. Uh, and I think that is a reflection of what we have just been through. Uh, and you could probably unpack that if you had a focus group that would include the Russian hacking, would include uh, how we campaign, uh, would include our partisanship, uh, our systems and institutions not working. And the other was uh, not a great deal of support for American customs and ideas, uh, which is a change uh, from previous polling. Uh, so I think what this says to me is that we are still, we still matter a great deal in the world. Our leadership matters, who we are matters, but we're sort of teetering a little bit on the edge of whether America as the, not the only power in the world, but the indispensable leader in the world uh, has fallen off a cliff, or about piggy, to. Yep. Can I just piggyback on Wendy's point? I actually had a slightly different, but consistent, I think, reaction to it, exactly the statistic you mentioned. Because a big part of foreign policy is not necessarily what the State Department does or anybody else does. It's the example we set as a society. Because it builds respect for the United States, and it's an example that others wish to emulate. And I think to the extent, for example, one of the most important foreign policy things we ever did was arguably the Civil Rights Movement. People see things like that and it resonates and it shows the health. And even Watergate in its own way was a powerful example of American democracy at work. What worries me a little bit about this is our ability to set an example. Mm. And that has two consequences. One, again, people won't respect this as much. And two, it'll only contribute to what we're already seeing around the world, which is the democratic recession. If you look around the world, there's an if you objectively measure the trends in democracies, how many countries are democratic and how democratic are the countries, if we consider them to be democratic, where they fit on the spectrum. There has been a serious recession in recent years, and this suggests to me the recession could well deepen. And this strain on democratic values is something we're gonna dig into in, in the ne next panel as well. Each of you has, you, between the two of you, you have 
tremendous operational experience. Don't add up the years, by the way. I'll I'm just saying that you, you've negotiated many things. You've seen, uh, seen ups and downs. You mentioned, Wendy, that when, when George W. Bush was reelected, that had an effect on, on America's uh, dealings with its, its, uh, its allies. Thinking not to three and a half years from now, but a year from now and a year and a half from now, where do you see points of strain when the U.S. tries to deal with North Korea, with Iran, with Syria, with the environment? How operationally will it matter that there's this attitude in the rest of the world? I think it will matter, sadly, quite a bit. Uh, you know, Richard and I, when we did a panel yesterday, both agreed that when the president decided to drop a mention of Article 5 out of his speech at the NATO summit, which is a, uh, an attack on one is an attack on all, and the only time that NATO has ever invoked Article 5 was for the United States after 9-11 to go into Afghanistan. So here is the President of the United States there for a memorial of 9-11 at NATO headquarters, it was in the speech and he takes it out and I cannot tell you how many Europeans really, you know, picked up the phone and said, we, we feel dissed totally uh, by this. So I think that when you hear Merkel give a speech about how Europe's going to go its own way, uh, quite frankly, she's only going to go so far. I said this yesterday because Germany has a historic past which is very much part of its everyday DNA and they'll never rise to being the world leader because they understand the anxiety that would provoke in the world. So we need Germany to be strong. We want people to do their part. Quite, quite agree with that. But I think we are going to see on all these issues, on North Korea already, the president thought he had a deal with China. Anybody who's been to China knew that the Chinese didn't think he had a deal with China. Uh, now he's disappointed in the fact that China hasn't, in a month, changed everything they've ever done. Um, <laughs> surprise and shock. Uh, and now he's going to try to see what he can do with the president of South Korea and make buddies with Modi, who is the prime minister of India and wants a hedge against China and thinks he can work well with us. So I think we're going to see this constant tumult of trying to figure out where the relationships are that I can try to cobble together the next tactical move, but I regret to say I don't see any thoughtful strategy on issues or in general. And to follow up on that before asking Richard a related question, is it objectively any more dangerous with North Korea or is it just messy compared to if, if the U.S. had a, an actual policy? Well, I think North Korea, I mean, Barack Obama, when he met with President-elect Trump, said the greatest and most difficult security issue in front of you is North Korea. A lot of people say, well, just leave it alone, but I believe the proliferation issue is enormous where Japan and South Korea are concerned for them to get nuclear weapons if we don't do something. And so I think that Trump not having a strategy, not having, in my view, a very tough comprehensive strategy uh, is going to increase the danger, for sure. So, uh, Richard, you've written uh, about the role, the ways in which China will try to fill some of the vacuum that the U.S. seems to be uh, creating. And after Trump withdrew from the TPP and from the Paris Agreement, there was a lot of commentary about this is the big opportunity for China. How serious is that prospect? How should we think of it? I think it's exaggerated. Uh, I've got like 30 seconds before I answer, and I'll say why I think it's exaggerated, which is uh, just coming back to your, your basic question. This could also affect us with North Korea another way. And it goes back to both what happened with the previous administrations, uh, but also this one, which is we're going to have to at some point make a case to the world about North Korea's uh, capabilities. And we're going to have to, in some cases, rely on American intelligence. And we will not be able to uh, have necessarily an Adley Stevenson moment where we can show the photographs. And that's where the question of confidence in and trust with the, of the United States will kick in in, in overdrive. And I think we are putting ourselves, shall we say... For the next generation in the audience, <laughs> take, take, take 10 seconds on the Adlai Stevenson moment. Okay. Uh, <laughs> or you could use the Srebrenica moment. Uh, but I also feel I could take my shoe off and do another Khrushchev moment. <laughs> yes. uh, at the UN in uh, October 62, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, when the Russians, the Soviets rather, were denying certain things, Adlai Stevenson, who was the US permanent representative, the ambassador to the UN, took out U2 spy photos, and it shocked and galvanized the world and totally transformed the, uh, 
debate, and I think we're going to have something potentially, we could have a little bit of a weapons of mass destruction issue with North Korea, and that to me was one of the worrisome things of the, of the, the, pu the, the, the pupil of China. The question about whether it can fill the gap that we're creating, because we are creating a, a gap in world leadership. I think not, because China's foreign policy is subservient to China's domestic, economic, and political challenges. So when they do things like their big infrastructure programs, One Belt, One Road, when they have their trade uh, initiative for the Asia uh, Pacific, when they approach issues like cyber or climate, it's always looking first at what this would mean for economic growth in China and the strength of the Communist Party in China. So I just uh, I think there's there is structural limits to the role that China can play. Now they will do their best to inch in to the enormous space we are creating. They will take some of that space, but they can't fill the space just given the, the nature of where China is in its own historical evolution. So, so each of you, again, has tremendous experience in the operating values and norms and professionalism of the US Foreign Service and the way it, it interacts with the world across administrations, across, across the decades. Um, I don't believe either of you was polled by this survey on lack of confidence in U.S. leadership, but if I'm polling you right now, how worried actually are you about the integrity and competence of U.S. foreign policy right now and the buffers that are built in against something actually crazy happening? Yeah, Wendy, how worried are yeah. you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I am deeply, deeply worried. Um, look, when you... I, I love the people at the State Department. I've had the privilege to serve many years, both in the Clinton administration and the Obama administration. It's, it's been an honor. And the career foreign service and the civil service and the locally employed staff in our embassies around the world just do an extraordinary job every day. But they have no leaders. Uh, Secretary Tillerson, engineer that he is, decided he needed to understand all the boxes bef and rearrange them before he uh, moved anybody forward to be uh, nominated and then confirmed by the U.S. Senate. So there aren't ambassadors around the world except in a few places uh, that are confirmed ambassadors. There, aren't leader there isn't leadership at the State Department. And the career officers look for that leadership, for that political leadership, because they know that represents the views of the, pre the current president. And they'll serve whoever is president. There's no policy process that really works, which Richard spoke to yesterday, so I'll, I'll let him speak to that further. Uh, Secretary Tillerson has decided for the next two years there will be no A100 classes. A100 are the incoming career Foreign Service officers, the young Foreign Service officers. A lot of the senior leadership has left because they did not get reassigned or in the case of the DCM in China decided that after we pulled out of Paris, given the pollution in China, uh, he couldn't actually support uh, working for this president. So he did an honorable but difficult thing and left the Foreign Service. So we don't have the senior leadership, we don't have the incoming Foreign Service. So, uh, and it doesn't appear, it, it doesn't appear there is a consistent policy process of decision making and then implementation, uh, not only the NATO example, but you have in, in what I think is a crisis that could erupt into a conflict, uh, the dispute between Saudi Arabia, the United Emirates, and Qatar, uh, where you have Secretary Tillerson and Secretary Mattis trying to settle everything down, work with the Kuwaitis to get rapprochement, and you have the President of the United States trying to go to war, you know, on Saudi Arabia's side. And this doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And it is a very dangerous and very explosive situation that needs very careful management and quiet U.S. leadership. Uh, and it's hard to make it happen. And Richard, spell out exactly the kind of thing you worry about. What, what, why does it matter that the State Department is sort of um, decapitated the way it is now? Let me answer that in a couple of ways. One is, this administration didn't walk into a situation of a global uh, harmony and peace. <coughs> this is not a criticism of his, you know, the 44th president or the 43rd president, but for a number of reasons, things they did and didn't do, simply global structural changes. This was about as tough as an inbox as I think any incoming president has had in quite a while with the, the sheer number and range of, of challenges. It was already a pretty crowded inbox. 
And so what it would have, so I would have said two things. It would take, the last thing you'd want to do is add to the inbox. And the second of all, you'd want to be really buttoned down and dealing with it, because when you do have 20 things coming at you, thinking about trade-offs, thinking about the allocation of resources, whether they're financial resources or hours in the day or human resources, is a really big issue. It doesn't just sort itself out. And so what we're finding is the administration is violating both of those principles. They're adding to the inbox, and it's a relatively unstructured process. So they began, I mean, when I wrote this book, A World in Disarray, um, I didn't know who was going to be the president. I don't know if I was writing it for Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders or any one of the 17 Republican candidates or Donald Trump. Because when you run for president, the only thing you can't determine is your inbox. You can choose your vice president, you can choose your cabinet, you can choose your policies. You can't determine what you inherit on January 20th. It was going to be tough. And these, this administration has added to it by a number of things. It's a long list. And they're coming at it. Uh, and what Wendy pointed to, I've worked in the State Department in two administrations. Uh, you need people there to provide the historical context, the institutional memory, to help you with your analysis, your decision making, and then your implementation. 90, you know, Woody Allen said 80% of life is showing up. Well, in some cases, 80% of life is also policy implementation. And what you have instead is a Secretary of State who's doing his best impersonation of Macaulay Culkin. And <laughs> it just doesn't make sense, given this inbox. You can explain that reference. <laughs> I think that the, uh, yeah, the, the home alone oeuvre is what we're <laughs> referring to here. Uh, I have, have one follow-up on that. It was during the transition time, you were actually in the press as a potential uh, diplomatic appointee for the Trump administration. Um, I wasn't. Yes. <laughs> so, so uh, and somehow they haven't come to me as press secretary yet, but you know, anything's possible. So, so if that had become serious, what would have been the arguments you would weigh about whether it was worth doing it? By extension, are H.R. McMaster and General Mattis doing the right thing by serving? Look, working in government <clears throat> when it's good, and the best experience I had was working for the 41st president, George Herbert Walker Bush. When it's good, it is as good as it gets. It is as uh, satisfying and as purposeful, and you feel you're making a contribution, you're making a difference. You can either observe history, sometimes you can influence it. And in every way, government at its best, I think, is one of the great, if you're fortunate enough, particularly the younger people here, to ever have that opportunity in a good situation, grab it. Government at its worst, however, uh, is pretty bad because you make an awful lot of sacrifices and compromises. And when I was being talked about in various ways for various jobs, uh, my wife and I and other certain friends uh, had extended conversations uh, about it. And my view is, uh, particularly at the most senior levels, you, you've got to feel, given some of the sacrifices and compromises you make, you've got to answer two questions positively. One is, do you really feel that the, it's a situation where you can have influence and an impact? Yeah, because when you've reached Wendy's point or my point in your career, you've got fairly defined, decided views, and you know what it is you want to help bring about or avoid. Uh, so one is whether you think the process will allow you to have influence. And second of all, look, you never win 100% of your battles. Nobody bats 1,000 in government. But you don't want to bat 100 either. So you've got to ask yourself, because you're going to, you know you're then going to be deputized to go out and represent the administration, whether it's on television or going over to brief for certain allies. And I would just simply say, I had already been through a situation, and we used to call this, my wife and I, professional days, where you spent the day arguing against the policy, you lost the argument, and then you were the one trotted out to go make the case to the allies about why the policy that was decided is the good one, and then you have to bait basically defend yourself against the same arguments you made that day uh, for the other policy. And you can only take so many professional days. And at which point you say, I'm not the right person. And I had a very, uh, I say? I'll, I'll say this, I had a very funny moment when, when one of the calls came and asking about whether I'd be interested for a certain uh, senior job. And I just simply said, I think if you look at my book, that was about to come out, and you look at where the administration and the president are likely to go, it would be one hell of a confirmation hearing, uh, <laughs> the contrast between the two. And I just, I, I just basically made the decision, 
that I didn't think uh, I could be uh, influential, and I thought that a ho really high percentage of the time I would not be comfortable defending what you need to be comfortable doing if you're going to work. And I think that's the question for the, the General Mattises and H.R. McMasters and Rex Tillersons. They've got to ask themselves on a fairly regular basis, do they feel they're having the kind of uh, influence they want? Would things be measurably not just different, but worse if they were not there? And are they comfortable getting up every day, working 16 hours a day, seven days a week, which is what it takes, putting on more miles and, you know, it's, it's like dog years. You age at a pretty rapid rate. Are they comfortable with those kinds of compromises and sacrifices? And I would simply say, uh, if they are, Godspeed. But if they're not, then they, uh, they ought to be thinking about their exit strategy. So we just have a couple of minutes left here. I wanted to ask each of you a, 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 an advice to America question. So this poll shows that around the rest of the world, people have lost faith in, faith in American government, but they retain some faith in the American people now. What can the American public best do to minimize the damage and redeem the rest of the world's potential faith in us or abiding faith in us? I think we have a lot of work to do over a period of time. I don't think we'll fix this quickly. Uh, I said yesterday, and I want to repeat it today, because maybe there are some new people here today. I think every single person who's here ought to go into a community in America you don't know and talk about national security and foreign policy. Listen really hard. We don't understand each other. We don't converse with each other. If we're going to converse with the world, we have to understand and know who we are and what we believe in uh, and what we're trying to get done in the world. There are a lot of people hurting in our country. Uh, they don't want to engage in the rest of the world. They want things to get fixed at home. Uh, Richard has written in, and spoken in the past, I think, quite eloquently that domestic policy and foreign policy are one and the same, and they are economic and national security are go hand in hand, hand in glove. Uh, and so I think we really need to be reaching out to each other and talking with each other. And then we can go and talk with the rest of the world and listen to them. Um, people's lives are very different around the world. And in the first poll, and I'll end here, the first poll that Pew did of 44 countries in 2002, people liked uh, globalization. They liked getting better food choices. They got, liked uh, getting better uh, clothing, our blue jeans, our music. Uh, but they were terrified of losing their way of life and their own identity. And that is still the case, and that is the case here in this country. And we need to be talking with each other and understanding what those different identities are and giving everybody the dignity of being who they are. Thank you. And, and, and Richard, the last minute is yours. Uh, amen to that. Let me suggest two different time horizons. One is the short term and one is the long term. I think in the short term, it's an argument for political activity, uh, in particular Congress, uh, but also candidates in 2018, 2020, get involved. And what, I think the, whatever else you think of the previous election, it shows that elections have consequences. And the fact that, what, only, what, 55, 60% of Americans would bother to vote? Who could? Uh, I wonder how many people out there marching in the last five months didn't march to the polls on election day. And I think you know, there ought to be a commitment for greater political uh, involvement. Second of all is the longer term. And so let me you know, make the argument that we do need to have national standards in education, and we need to have our curriculum at the high school level begin to have elements of civics and elements of our global literacy so that people begin to understand the world. And at colleges, which is in many cases more of a free market system, uh, as the people shelling out 50 grand or whatever it costs a year now, uh, you ought to demand that there's uh, requirements, that there's core curriculum and things like civics, and again, the basics of uh, global literacy. So when someone emerges off a campus, he or she has under his or her belt some of the basics about what makes this country tick and what makes this world tick. Because without that, they will not be able to fulfill their roles as citizens. And that's something we can control. So, so. So. <laughs> so you're going to see more from both Richard and Wendy in a few minutes. But for now, please join me in thanking them. doing the intro here? So, okay, so, so we now have for our second uh, all-star panel, 
we have Yasha Munk and we have Alexander Betts. We're going to talk about a European, some of the European aspects of these same tensions and some of the underlying political values about the state of uh, democracies, the state of open liberal societies. So um, I think you were both introduced early on, right? Did, did, did Michael introduce you or shall, okay. Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna now brag on you uh, for both. So Yasha Monk, who's immediately to my left, is a lecturer at, at Harvard and is a fellow at New America, which I've been involved in for a long time, and has been an increasingly influential speaker on questions of the health and resilience of democracy, the way in which all the modern uh, tensions, what be they ethnic, technological, all the rest, are affecting democracy, how it can, can defend itself. He uh, wrote a very uh, celebrated book called um, Stranger in My Own Country, A Jewish Family in Modern Germany. You were born in Germany, you have Polish parents, and now a US citizen, I believe. So, uh, so Yasha is here. And next to him is Alexander Betts, who's a professor at Oxford, social scientist, who has become a very influential speaker around the world, in Europe and around the world, on questions of, of refugees and sort of the fiber of European society, what it was in England and the UK that led to Brexit, what it is in the rest of the continent that's leading to the, to the strains there. So we've heard from Richard and Wendy about some of these institutional and strategic and operational consequences for US diplomacy of the attitudes we saw. Now we're gonna hear about how some of these things seem within Europe, the international parallels and differences. I'll start with each of you, the same question I asked for Richard and Wendy. Did anything surprise you or catch your eye, Yasha, from what you saw there? Um, and, and Paul, um, yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm struck by the degree to which views of the European Union have grown more positive over the last year. Um, I think that's partially as a result of Brexit and the fact that Brexit has both revealed to a lot of Brits how much they have to lose in leaving the European Union for I'm perhaps a little less optimistic about uh, them making that change. Um, I think that Brexit is going to happen and we may very well end up with a hard Brexit, uh, even though more and more Brits are recognizing how much damage that's going to do. But certainly I think on the European continent, people have been looking at what's going on in Britain. They said, we don't need that political chaos. We don't need that to happen. Um, and I think it also shows something, and I'd be intrigued to hear your opinion on this, um, about the sort of timing of a Brexit vote. That actually uh, there was a perfect storm between the depths of a Euro crisis, which is not solved, but which has um, softened a little bit just because of economic growth in the continent over the last couple of years, um, and the refugee crisis. And it was really those two things coming together which I think made a lot of Europeans feel Suddenly you're asking us not just to have free trade and even movement of workers within the European Union um, to have some amount of pooled sovereignty in order to solve big global challenges, but you know what? You're asking us to send money to countries where we don't quite feel the solidarity, and you're asking us to take in refugees, and we don't want to do those things. So um, that's, to me, interesting, but that sort of crisis of the European Union um, seems to have uh, softened somewhat in the last years. Thank you, Alexander. I, mean, I will follow up on that in a moment, but I'm going to ask for Alexander's uh, impressions of the survey. I think what struck me most about the survey was Richard's initial reaction to the survey. <laughs> that the president of the Council on Foreign Relations can sit through a survey that shows the US's global reputation falling off a cliff, and the thing that strikes him is that the prize for the most self-inflicted wound in global politics goes to the UK. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the tragedy is that he's right. In a way, the one positive thing we've contributed to the world with Brexit is to make Americans feel better about this. <laughs> that is the kind of global public good that we are offering through this process. Can I, can I just jump in for one second? I think actually Trump has also made Europeans feel a lot yes. better about themselves. Yes. Europeans yeah. love to look at Trump and see, oh, look, all of our prejudices are confirmed. We are the best after all. So there's a little this, bit of... This is the reincarnation of the special relationship. This reciprocal <laughs> mockery that we can continue. But the tragedy is it's absolutely right. We've gone through this schizophrenic process of flip-flopping that we can see that survey and see that a country which is about to start on negotiations on Brexit, one, has a majority support for the European Union, <laughs> two, believes that the European Union is better off with the UK in it, and three, more people believe that Brexit will be more harmful than it will be good. That's a tragedy, but it poses a question, why and how? And for me, I agree very much with what you just said, Yasha, that this wasn't a vote, the referendum, on the European Union per se. The two most salient issues for Leave voters 
which are closely bound up with one another, were immigration and sovereignty. And without the preceding refugee crisis, the portrayal of the so-called migrant crisis in Europe, I would suggest Brexit simply wouldn't have happened. And partly what's happened since is the immigration threat and its perception have been put back in a certain box, and now we've got a more serious debate about the European Union. So I think it's important to see in the Pew survey the huge and very hefty response from European unions that shows dissatisfaction, huge dissatisfaction with the European Union's handling of the refugee crisis. For very different reasons, there was that rejection of that response in different European countries. But from the left, from the right, the refugee crisis was mishandled, and it's been played in the media in a way that's left my country looking like a nostalgia theme park to the 1950s floating in the North Sea. <laughs> So, so, so to follow up these very interesting complementary points you, you, you both have made, I'm wondering if it's possible that the world, including most of us, is over-interpreting and over-reacting to the political news of the last two years, and that after Brexit and then Trump, there was essentially every news magazine and every editorial page said, liberal democracy in crisis, inclusive societies on the way down, whereas, as you both pointed out, the Brexit vote was very unusual and might would have turned out differently in different circumstances. The U.S. vote, nobody expected it to go this way, including the Trump campaign until the last day. The, his opponent got three million more votes, et cetera. B the Brexit vote will have huge consequences. Trump's election will have huge consequences. But is it possible we have over-interpreted this as a rejection and failure of the liberal way? I don't think so, unfortunately. So the first thing to say is that what, what we've really seen is just that we're in a moment of very, very rapid political change. Um, I just said this on the last panel, but, 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 but even when you look at something like Emmanuel Macron, that is in some ways positive, mm -hmm. but it shows a complete pulverization of the old French political system. And it's very difficult to think of any election in the last uh, couple of years which looked like a normal election, which would have looked familiar to people in those political systems uh, 10 or 15 years ago. And so we are seeing, uh, and that I think comes from real reasons, that people are unhappy with their politics, that people are dissatisfied with where the countries are going, that they're very worried about the future. To interrupt and there, yeah, so would you include the, the Obama-Romney election in the, I mean, to me that seemed like a normal election, and that was only four plus years ago. Yeah, so I, think, so I think you're right that that was a normal election. For if you look at some of the primaries that were leading up to it, those looked pretty, certainly on the Republican side, mm -hmm. they looked pretty topsy-turvy and crazy as well. And it so happened that somehow the most sort of uh, cookie-cutter Republican candidate ended up winning the nomination. But that could easily have gone another way, as we've now learned. And, and so, so I think the first thing to say is we are in an era of political change. And most of us haven't lived through that. For the last decades, we weren't in eras of political change in North America and Western Europe. Now, that doesn't mean that the bad guys always win. Sometimes the good guys win. Sometimes Macron wins. <laughs> but it certainly means that the bad guys can win. And, and so I don't think we can write off what happened in Brexit, and we certainly cannot write off what happened with Donald Trump. I mean, this is the sort of election that should not be possible. It should not be possible for a candidate like Donald Trump with his extent of open disavowal of basic democratic norms, threatening to jail his political opponent, saying that he might not accept the outcome of the election, let alone all of the things about international relations, calling to doubt the country's most vital alliances, it should not be possible for him to win. And we live in a different world uh, where, where it is possible that, 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 that he wins. And we'll come later to some of the circumstances that made that possible and whether they might be changed. But let me ask, ask you, Alexander, again. do you think there, there has been an over-interpretation of this and also use that to, as to segue to the current state of the refugee emergency, if you will, in Europe, which was the condition for the Brexit vote? I think one of the major shifts that we have seen and I think we'll continue to see is the transformation of politics to being no longer just about left versus right, but about the way in which we see globalization, whether we embrace it or whether we fear it. And I think politics has had to try to reconcile globalization with democracy, to recognize that to embrace issues like global trade, like immigration, you have to take those who feel left behind with you. And in Europe, for a long time through the second half of 2015 and 2016, there was a fear of the rise of the far right that Marine Le Pen might get elected, that the UK Independence Party would become electorally more viable. That hasn't happened. But what we have seen is a mainstreaming of some of those more, if you like, conservative, 
centre-right policies within politics. So we've seen Macron rather than Le Pen. We've seen Mark Rutter in the Netherlands rather than Geert Builders. We've seen, or we thought until recently, Theresa May consolidating her power in the UK based on many of the policies and ideas that had previously been put forward by UKIP. So I think we're getting an embedding yeah. of things that we might have regarded to have been illiberal policies, an embedding of anti-immigration sentiments, policies that look more protectionist within the mainstream. So the challenge in a way of fearing the electability of the far right, I think, is over, but we've got a reinvention of politics, which is now a politics that's more favorable towards exclusion, restricting flows and movements, and an unresolved challenge of how those who support liberal values, and it's worth bearing in mind that liberal in the UK and Europe means something a little different from over here. Over here, as far as I can tell, it means basically left wing. In Europe, it means autonomy and freedom, which is a much more bipartisan interpretation. Can I just jump in for one second there? Because um, I, I absolutely agree that part of what's happened in countries like the Netherlands is that sort of mainstream parties have taken on part of the agenda of the far right and thereby helped to sort of slow their rise. Um, but I don't agree with the fact or the idea that the threat from organized far-right parties, which are more dangerous in many ways, is over. I think it, 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 part of the problem is that our baseline became the wrong one. After Brexit and Trump, we basically said, well, the baseline is that the crazy people always win, and when they don't, let's pat ourselves on the back. And so then you had the Austrian election, where you had a candidate who literally comes from a party with deep Nazi roots, only getting 47.5% of the vote, rather than 50.1% of the vote, and the reaction was, Hurrah, look at us, democracy wins. I think that's too low a bar. When you look at France, you see that Marine Le Pen is far from winning, and that's great, but she doubled the record that her father set in the second round of the presidential elections five years ago. And actually, by the way, she did much, much better among young voters than she did among older voters. So there's lots of countries where the young people are most attracted to those far-right candidates. So the idea that that danger is over from the organized populists, uh, I think is a little um, uh, too optimistic. So uh, I have a 30-second intervention of my own actual thought here, and then I, I'm going to, to ask our, our guests about a, uh, a related question. Uh, Alexander has, has written and spoken very eloquently about this tension between globalization and democracy, which I agree with, but I also think, at least in US politics, this is not a new thing, but an old thing. You know, from the 1810s onward, the, the tariff and having free trade of various sorts and immigration. So it's been at least at the heart of U.S. politics for a long while. It was damped down for a while, and we're seeing it rise again. That's my thought. Now, here's my, my question. From the U.S. perspective, thinking about Russia has become entirely just partisanized. If you're a Republican, you think there's no problem. If they're a Democrat, you're trying to think how you can raise this as a problem. Yasha, I'm gonna take you as a proxy non-American for the moment. You can <laughs> have your European roots. What, what is, how is the Russian phenomenon, both strategically and in its intervention in Western democracy, how is it seen in the UK right now? Yeah, I mean, I think the UK sits in an awkward position between Europe and its special relationship with the US. And NATO, historically, is extremely important to the UK. So we're watching and observing as this sort of spat plays out between Germany and Trump, with the US asking for more NATO bills to be paid by Europe, and Merkel saying we can't rely on our old allies in quite the same way. And the UK is caught in between. We want to be able to gravitate towards the US in terms of the way it looks towards Russia. But we're very skeptical, equally, about the role that Russia has played more recently in Ukraine and its neighborhood, the role that Russia plays in Syria. And so we're in this very awkward position of having instincts that see Putin as deeply problematic for regional security, for the dynamics playing out in Syria and the Middle East, the knock-on effects that's having for regional security through the refugee crisis. And yet, we don't want to be in a position while we're still trying to figure out what Trump's position is vis-a-vis -vis Russia that we gainsay publicly and split that line. Nyasha, how, how is somebody with a European background, do you see the current discussion about Russia? So Cass Sunstein yesterday gave a great talk, and, and one of his punchlines was that most people say, you know, I don't like it, and I don't believe it. It's not the other way around, yeah. right? It's, it's what you start with is you don't like it, and that's why you don't believe it. You see that in, in discussions about climate change, right? If you tell people, if you believe in climate change, you're going to have to not drive an SUV and not turn up your air conditioning, 
people are not going to believe climate change because they don't want to give up their SUV and they want to have their air conditioning. I think a lot of European foreign policy at the moment is very similar about Russia, but actually also about the United States. Mm -hmm. um, the mantra of German politics for the last 25 years has been, we're surrounded by friends. And that's a nice thing to tell yourself because if you're surrounded by friends, you don't really need to spend any money on the army. You don't really have to have any strategic thinking. Um, you can sort of be a foreign policy dignitary and never have an original thought in your life, and you're doing just fine by your country, yeah. right? Well, actually, Germany and a lot of other European countries are now in a situation where the most basic assumptions of certainly the last 20 years of foreign policy and actually the last 50 years of foreign policy are out. The first of it is surrounded by friends. No, they're not. You see that Russia is having a real impact in Central Europe and putting real pressure on Western Europe and that they're starting to have allied governments in a lot of Central Europe and that fundamentally changes the situation. And by the way, all of your foreign policy for 50 years has been based on the idea of having a reliable American partner who always promises to come to your defense in an hour of need and who actually wants to further democratic systems in Western Europe. And now you have somebody who refuses to acknowledge Article 5 when he goes to speak to NATO, and who seems by instinct and perhaps even by values to prefer every dictator from Rodrigo to Turta <laughs> to the rulers of Saudi Arabia to Angela Merkel and Emmanuel Macron and everybody yeah. else in Europe. So you should be radically rethinking, and I'm somebody who is a deep defender of a transatlantic relationship, but if you're sitting in Europe in a capital and thinking seriously about foreign policy strategy, you should be having very serious thoughts about how to confront Russia and how to manage your long-term relations with the United States. The good news from the perspective of America is that they're not doing that. Because the foreign policy community in these countries is very homogeneous, very traditionalist, very slow. Um, and so if we're lucky and we manage to get, excuse my partisan politics, rid of Donald Trump in 2020 and return to a sane American foreign policy, I think the damage will be limited. But over time, this is going to push against what European foreign policy looks like. For now, we're in denial, but that denial can't last forever. I have a question now for each of you about a subject you've both addressed, which is in involving sort of the fabric of civic society and democracies, what's necessary to make things work. At the end of the last session, both Richard Haas and Wendy Sherman were in their advice to America were saying that people need to be involved to learn civics, et cetera. So it's a, a two-part question for each of you. So, Alexander, you were saying that, that the UK has embarked on a course that it knows it's fault, is folly. Most people don't want it, they think it'll be harmful, et cetera, but nonetheless, uh, th th this is the, the, the course that, it, that is, is, is underway. Um, what, what in the fabric of how people in the UK make decisions and take in information will make them more resistant to that kind of tragedy in the future? I think one of the interesting dynamics going on in international politics at the moment is what sort of political scientists would refer to as sort of two-level games, only on steroids. That traditionally we could sort of have confidence that our ambassadors, our diplomatic apparatus could come up with agreements with other countries and we'd be able to stick to them. Now we've got to pay more attention to the role that domestic electorates play in vetoing those agreements in a way that can flip-flop back and forwards. So in the UK case, the dialogue with the European Union over Brexit, the negotiators on both sides frankly don't know how to begin negotiations. The EU looks at the UK and says, what are you doing? And the UK is looking to the European Union saying, we want to negotiate on a hard Brexit stance, but we're not quite sure we've got enough electoral confidence given the general election results of the last couple of weeks. You see that playing out on a global scale multilaterally with instances like the Paris Agreement on climate change, where Donald Trump wasn't even quite sure what his position was when he turned up for the international meeting, but had to be in a position of consulting back home. So that two-level game dynamic means that to engage internationally in the reconstruction of World Order 2.0, we've got to have social cohesion back home to create a mandate for the recreation of a hopefully liberal global order. And that mandate is very hard because it means domestic electorates that may not be versed in international issues, that may be skeptical of international trade, skeptical of climate change, skeptical of immigration, and deeply skeptical of international institutions have to be brought along for the ride. How do you create that social cohesion? Well, the area I work on, refugees, is an exemplar of that challenge because I want my country and Europe to play a more constructive, cooperative role in protecting and assisting refugees. 
but I'm deeply aware that for that to be possible, electorates have to come on the journey, and that many electorates have been taught by politicians and by uh, often irresponsible media that refugees, falsely in my view, equate to terrorists, that they destabilize our economies, destabilize the fabric of our societies. And so we have to find a way of not pandering to xenophobia, not pandering to the lowest common denominator, but providing leadership that takes people who feel alienated with us in our domestic outlook and as the basis for our international engagement and the reconstruction of a world order fit for purpose in a multipolar world. Yeah. So. So, 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 Yasha, your version of that question is you were saying earlier that an electoral role, result in the United States that shouldn't have been able to occur occurred. Somebody who was just different in his qualifications from anybody else who'd ever, ever run seriously for the office. We know all the arguments about changes in the news media and all the rest that have made this possible. What could the United States do to make it not possible in the future? Is there any immunization that the civic... Uh, uh, fiber of the United States can, can provide itself to make this less likely? Um, so, so some of my research shows the degree to which people have sort of um, fallen out of love with democracy, give less importance to democracy than they used to, um, only see the negative aspects of their own system because I think they no longer have a life sense of a threat under which democracy always operates. They're not from a generation that fought against fascism or communism or saw their parents do that. They don't understand that there are real authoritarian and totalitarian systems in the world and that democracy is always brittle. And so they only see the negative sides of their own political system. They say, this is bad and this is bad. Um, and it blinds them to some of the important things that we need to protect. Now, I think the good news is that Donald Trump is doing some of that for us. That some of those young people who in the surveys that I've been working on um, say we don't care about democracy, actually do care about some of the things that the current administration is attacking, and that that can lead to, uh, to some degree to a re-engagement with our democratic norms and ideas. But I think it has to go beyond that. Richard Haas was absolutely right that civics education, which always sounds sort of slightly boring and sort of vague and so on, but that, that is crucial to this. So we no longer have a consensus around what constitutional values actually mean concretely, and we no longer have any sense as educators or as journalists or as people like everybody in the audience with, 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 with real platforms that it's one of our most crucial and hallowed tasks to try and educate a new generation into understanding why for all of its flaws our democratic system is better than the alternatives. Now, having said all of this, I also think that uh, elites need to move on something which is that we cannot be the blind defenders of the status quo. But we need to understand some of the real drivers of frustration, including stagnating living standards and many other things, and give people hope about the future. I think as long as we must not want politics to become pro or against globalization, or pro or against a sort of multi-ethnic democracy, pro or against immigration, because if it becomes that, then we'll sometimes lose elections. And then the outcomes will be disastrous. You want the main political cleavage to be one that you can afford to lose sometimes, right? I might be on the center left economically, other people might be on the center right. That's fine, I can live with them winning some of the times. I'm not sure that I can win with the outright opponents of globalization winning some of the time because they can actually destroy our world system in a really destructive way. And, but I think part of that, and this does not come easily to me, as somebody who, you know, you mentioned my book, my identity is complicated and so on. I, I, in many ways, share the aspiration of many of my colleagues in political philosophy and so on to overcome the space of a nation. I don't think that's realistic. I think one thing we've learned over the last two years and one thing we've learned over the last 200 years is that nationalism remains the most potent force of political history. And either we fill nationalism with a, a, a progressive meaning that, that, that emphasizes what we share in common as Americans, and that emphasizes that the nation state can actually persist and thrive in the era of globalization, that free trade and all of those things don't need to be bad for the nation, or the nation is going to take on its ugliest and most violent form. So that sets up the last question I'm gonna ask each of you, an unfair question, and so just a minute or so for, for each of you in our two or three minutes left. A problem with reading history is that you know how things turned out. 
and so you, net, you can't avoid imputing moods to things. So you read about you know, England in 1912, and you think, oh my god, you know, what, what, what's ahead? Or you read about any place in, in, in Europe in the 1920s, and it is overhung with this, this uh, mood of, of, of doom. On the other hand, you read back to the United States in the 1960s and 70s, it was, had terrible troubles, but you knew it was sort of powering its way through. When people 100 years from now are writing the history of democracies in this era, is it going to be with a mood of sort of like Weimar, 1920s, things are doomed, or like a US uh, late 60s, powering their way through troubles towards uh, a better result? Yeah, I'm tempted to cop out and say the future is undefined, and it's for <laughs> us to make it collectively. Um, I was going to say, damn. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, one of the comparisons that's often been made is to the interwar years, and that period when we had instability, multipolarity, the failure of international institutions, economic challenge, financial crisis, and the resurgence of the far right. I think in many ways there are parallels, but there are things that obviously are massively different. Uh, a century on, globalization, technology, the way in which people engage with politics have transformed that playing field. But I think what I would like to respond with is the idea not of optimism, not of pessimism, but of hope. And my sense, and maybe this is a bit too sanguine from the other side of the Atlantic, and it comes back to what I said in response to Richard, is that on this side of the Atlantic, you're in the privileged position that in three and a half years, you get to reimagine a better America. <laughs> and you get to learn lessons and think and reflect and come up with better values. We, on the other hand, will have destroyed our non-existent constitution. I hope it isn't quite that bad, but when you actually have the fragmentation of your union, referenda of parts of your country potentially splitting what that country is, when you have attacks on many of the core values of society, you're in trouble. And so I think the challenge is to be able to, in part, wait out this period of turbulence and uncertainty, build bridges across the divide, surmount polarization, and try and come up with an inclusive politics that can navigate this tension between globalization and democracy. I think Yasha's last point about asserting that political ideology shouldn't become pro or anti-globalization, it's equally not going to be left or right in the same way. We've got to reinvent those categories, reinvent political identity while respecting community. Part of that is creating new forms of we, we that is premised upon nationalism, but again, coming from an island where what it is to be British is deeply contested and subject to debate. We need to posit a we that works with sovereignty, works with nationalism, but can embrace global transformation, have the kind of civic education, civic engagement that's needed to navigate that. And if we do that, we can emerge stronger, and Brexit and Trump will have been the things that define what was positive in the first half of the 21st century. And Yash, I invite you to say I agree. But, <laughs> but you can say more than that if you want. I, I will say 10 seconds more okay. than I agree, before I do agree. Um, I think part of the question, it's not the only question, but part of the question that will determine how democracy fares and how historians are going to look back at this moment 100 years from now, is whether we manage to make multi-ethnic democracy work, which is something that Europe has never historically done, and the United States has historically struggled with because they're always deeply hierarchical multi-ethnic societies. Now, I think the good news here for the United States is that I deeply believe America actually has a better chance of making that work, and it's a different aspect to something I agree with you than a lot of Europe. I mean, in Europe, you know, it seems obvious to people that if you don't look like the rest of the population, if you don't, weren't born in a country, if you don't have deep historical roots in the country, you're not a real... German or Italian or Frenchman. I think in America, we still do have that understanding. And so the future is in our hands. I, I do want to double down on that point. And it's particularly in the hands of America because it remains the case that we can make multi-ethnic democracy work here. We can marry a, a progressive understanding of what the nation means that is inclusive of all kinds of different people, of different races and different religions with a forward-looking vision of globalization that actually provides people with a decent livelihood. And I'm pretty convinced that if it's going to fail in the United States, it's going to fail everywhere. So this is something that we should all fight for and that we can fight for. So 
with that, I, I view hopeful prospect. I'm going to invite uh, Richard and Wendy and Michael back up to the stage. We'll have a few minutes for questions from the audience. Thanks. More chairs will appear here, I believe. Actually, maybe I'll stand over here on the side to take questions and. Of course, please. Shall we, shall we all sort of scoot over? Is that the idea? Alex, he's coming in. You agree with me? Oh, all right, all right. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Not helping. There we go. Oh, they have a chair for you. Okay, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll come okay. have a seat. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. If you raise your hands, I will try to see you and call on you. And yes, sir, I'll start here in the in the middle. Yes, yes, sir, with your yes. Wait for a microphone to come to you. And. If there's somebody in particular you'd like to have the question, please address it and as concisely as we can. Yes. <clears throat> yes, uh, Chip Cummins from uh, AREI. Uh, gentlemen from Oxford, um, do you think that in any way uh, the Brexit phenomena uh, set up uh, what occurred uh, here in the United States um, December 8th. Do you see a connection? So I gave a TED talk on Brexit five days after Brexit. And one of the things I said is the specter of Brexit is in all our societies. And I suggested it had implications for the US election. And I think a lot of people saw that coming. It wasn't just me. But when Trump was able to have Nigel Farage, one of the leaders of the Leave campaign, on stage with him and was able to say a victory for him would be Brexit plus, 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 he was invoking that idea. And I think Brexit emboldened the idea that Trump could win the election. I think many of his supporters and potential voters saw that a certain form of change was possible, that the pollsters didn't always get it right, and that a vote that was anti-establishment could succeed and be electorally transformative. Given how marginal the ultimate election outcome was, I don't know how it would have played out in particular states, but I think it would have made some degree of difference. Whether a defining different or difference or otherwise, I don't know. But it's clear that Brexit played out in US politics and that it's played out in other parts of Europe and been invoked by people like Marine Le Pen as well. If you want to extend that, I disagree with that, but it's up to you. <laughs> yes, so, so uh, briefly from, uh, yes, I, I disagree too, but go ahead. Yeah, I, I actually think 99% of Americans didn't know what Brexit was. I think it was irrelevant to the American vote. The implication, it said though, there was something going on in societies in Europe as well as here. So I think in that sense, it was a warning signal to us. But the, the idea that it had any causation, I think zero. The only British political action in recent years that's had causation here was the British decision not to support military action in Syria, mm -hmm. which then I think undermined what little confidence Barack Obama had to react to the red line challenge. There, there was some causation. In terms of Brexit, I would say absolutely not. So uh, we probably have many views, but let's just take another question. Back here, the young lady, back with your hand up in the, the rear. Hi. Um, as someone who grew up in the UK and now lives in the US, so I have dual citizenship, and as a young person, what do you think, I mean, I'm, this is open to anyone, is, because it's the US and the UK, what do you think is the best thing that I can do as a citizen of both nations, like, moving forward? Who would like to give dual citizenship? You're, you're a dual citizen, right? <laughs> Any other dual right. citizens here? Yeah, I don't know what the question was about dual citizenship, but um, I think, uh, look, I think there's, there's, there's a lot of initiatives, both in Britain and the United States, to stand up for the right things, and, and sort of everybody can pick their own flavor, right? I mean, there's very activist groups. Um, there are uh, groups that really are trying to protect, that, that don't take the fight on policy, but really trying to protect democratic norms and institutions, some of those in a very bipartisan way, even people like Evan McMullen are sort of doing some of those things. I think there's a whole breadth of social society organizations that are desperately in need of smart young people who, who engage in them, who fight for them. Um, so just find one where you feel there's a match between the kind of action that you want to take 
um, and your idea of what's important in the world and get involved. And I, was saying, yes. yeah. I think transnational identity is a really valuable thing in contemporary politics. So whether it's that you've got dual UK American citizenship or something else, I think people with transnational backgrounds and across different generations, that's a large part of the American public, can speak on behalf of values of diversity, multiculturalism, multi-ethnic societies in a slightly different way. So using that identity as a form of bridge, I think, can be valuable. Uh, Richard has a... Uh, a Push back again. I'm in my difficult phase this afternoon. Uh, <laughs> but I want to say, I do as said, Alex did come around to my point of view, because Brexit is in some ways permanent. What Mr. Trump has done in many cases uh, will, 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 will not be. I think we have to be very careful, though, with transnational identity for reasons both of them uh, pointed out. We've got to make sovereign commitment to national identity not incompatible with globalization. And it's why whenever I hear the phrase global citizen, I reach for my gun, because it will discredit the idea of transnationalism. It will base, no, we need to be, where citizenship is still a national concept. We've got to be, or in some cases, dual national, but it's got to be, you need to be sensitive to globalization, aware of it, and so forth. But we, if we basically start talking about citizenship as something other than nationally based, we will lose the argument about being involved in the world. I, 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 I think more important than you being a dual citizen yeah. is your being an activist. Mm -hmm. And as Yasha said, just pick your passion and go do it. I was in an airport recently, and there were a whole bunch of young preteen girls. And they all had on gray t-shirts that said, she believes she could, so she did. Mm -hmm. And I asked the adult who was with these young girls who they were and what they were doing. They were Girl Scouts <laughs> on their way to a celebration in New Orleans. And I grew up going to brownies and Girl Scouts. You know, it was be prepared, which was a good thing to learn in life. But she believed she could, so she did. Go do. <laughs> Did you want to say yes? Yeah. <laughs> Just one word on the sort of dual nationality issue. I think the thing that we have to defend is that you know you shouldn't be an activist as a British American citizen. You should be an activist in Britain as a British citizen and an activist in America as yes. an American. Quite agree. Yeah. Quite agree. I, I was born, grew up in Germany. I still have German citizenship. But I became an American citizen three months ago, and I'm 100% an American citizen. And I became an American citizen because it was the greatest honor of my life to swear to defend the US Constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Just to push back a little bit, because Richard keeps speaking after me. Um, and you think you get I, to ask questions. I, 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 I certainly wouldn't dare sit on US soil and, and question the, the primacy of citizenship and the need for patriotism. But I would say, <laughs> but. I would say the move in the world is towards more and more people having transnational identities. As we get more and more immigration, as we have more and more globalization, people will have multiple complex identities. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't have a primary citizenship. That doesn't mean that they shouldn't have civic commitment to the public sphere they engage in. But I think it's dangerous if we ask people to push to one side all of their other values aside from citizenship that are useful for building community and building mutual understanding. Just 30 seconds. Really fascinating phenomena. Most of us in America, when we're in America, define ourselves in a hyphenated way. Jewish American, Italian American, uh, German American, Polish American, whatever. When we go abroad, we're Americans. Uh, we identify ourselves as Americans abroad. Here, we embrace the multiplicity of our identity, but we are fundamentally Americans. And I think that is the answer to the dilemma you're putting on the table. So I made a battlefield real-time decision to use all of our available time, which we just have done, on, on various <laughs> manifestations of this one question. Thank you for the, sorry we didn't get to them, but please join our panel.